My name is Anna and I'm running with my partner Joe Ethical Pets. Today is our first birthday of being in business, so we're quite happy. So I bought an apron to celebrate. <laughs> I've entitled this talk, Are Vegan Pet Foods Healthy? Um, but actually that question gets a bit boring after a while because the main issue is lack of research. Um, the first thing I would like to point out about the question of health is that there is no evidence that vegan pet food is harmful, whereas there is stacks of evidence that various meat foods are harmful. Um, that's partly to do with the lack of research, but still, uh, don't ever assume that meat food is healthy just because it has meat in it. I'm going to divide my talk into three parts. The first part will be about um, preconceptions and philosophy, kind of what our instincts are, what we think natural means, what's necessary for an animal, and a little bit about nutritional requirements. The second part will be about science. Um, we'll talk about dogs and veganism, cats and veganism, and what happens if it goes wrong and we fail and we don't meet the criteria needed to keep our dog healthy. Um, and the last part will be about the bigger picture and the future of veganism in animals, including pitfalls and progress, and disagreeing with other people, which is not actually my favourite thing to do. Um, <laughs> okay, so first of all, let's just talk a little bit about what our instincts are. I think a good example of a long-held belief and instinct is that cats eat tuna and drink milk. We are starting to understand as a wider society, not just as vegans, that this is a bit weird. Um, the first page of the Wikipedia article on tuna says, a tuna is a saltwater finfish. I would love to meet the cat which goes swimming in the sea, <laughs> or swimming at all. Um, so, and another point is that, as we may know as vegans, humans are an exception in the natural world for continuing to consume milk. Um, so the thing about animals, humans and non-human animals, is that the most natural thing we do with food is eat what tastes good. Now for humans this is becoming a huge problem because MSG tastes good and massive amounts of fat taste good. Just to examine where this comes from, uh, why do we think cats eat tuna and milk? Um, mostly it's many years of cats eating this unnatural food because it tastes good. Um, and there's some, I've got a great picture of, um, it's an old advert from 110 years ago with um, a milk separating machine, it's like got a wheel and a cog and a lady and a dress. And um, there's a little cat there trying to get at the milk. And this is, you know, over 100 years we've been advertising this. And we have this advert from, is it Cravendale, with the cats trying to control the milkman? You know, this still prevails today, despite the fact that we know that it's not really good for cats to have milk. Another belief, for example, more complicated, could be that vegan pet food is less nutritious. So I've used the word nutritious specifically, um, that's not to do with health, that's specific with nutrients. So, again from Wikipedia, we have nutrition is the provision to cells and organisms of the materials necessary in the form of food to support life. Just to uh, read something else, uh, here's a quote from online. Nutrients and high quality ingredients are both important in pet food. However, high quality nutrients are especially vital because the body absorbs nutrients and not ingredients. Now, that may sound like vegan propaganda, but actually it's from the Hills website. So even these um, horrendously unethical companies agree that the animal absorbs the nutrients rather than the ingredients. Um, so this point about ingredients versus nutrition is really key in the vegan debate. So another point, again, referring back to my initial point about nutrition, is that the diet of an organism is, is what it eats, uh, is largely determined by the perceived palatability of foods. So just to reiterate, again, naturalness and palatability are very linked. Um, so why do we think that vegan pet foods are less nutritious? Um, it's very interesting because it doesn't make a lot of sense actually. For example, dog foods, the one big study that we have on vegan dog foods, the food used was made by pedigree and tested in, um, in a, you know when animals have to travel abroad and they have to be in confinement for a while because of rabies, it was tested in there to check that they absorb the nutrients. And yet, pedigree say nothing about this. Pedigree have designed a vegan food, used a vegan food, tested to make sure that it's, it's acceptable to the dogs and palatable to the dogs. And if you ask pedigree, are vegan pet foods nutritious, they would almost certainly say no. Um, which I think is quite strange. So, a lot of the misunderstandings are quite similar to the arguments 
that people make about vegan human diets being um, less nutritious. It's just bad science for the most part. Um, not to say that there are no questions for animals, but yeah. Okay, so uh, my point about these assumptions is that we should question our assumptions rigorously because they may be wrong, in inaccurate or illogical. And once you start questioning, things get different and complicated very quickly, just on a logical level. Um, so, just because we've taken the time to question uh, meat and vegan food for pets, it doesn't mean that we agree or disagree, it just means we've given it the time that it deserves. So it, it's of course worth questioning, it's definitely worth having a go and, and having a look. Dogs need meat to keep them strong and healthy. Um, this one is really shown, at least in the short term, to be untrue. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, cats are obligate carnivores, so they insert pop science here. Um, my favourite one is um, they'll die if they don't have meat. I'm like, okay, my cat's still alive. <laughs> so uh, unless they're zombies or vampires, you know, I don't want that. Um, another example is dogs and cats prefer to eat meat, that they choose meat actively. Um, this is not my experience at all. Um, and something that actually came up the other day is that um, when you sell pet food you come to realise how much stuff they have to put in a meat kibble to make a cat eat it. The vegan cat food has brewer's yeast and a little bit of seaweed and the cats love it. I mean what does this say about the meat food versus the vegan food? I'm not saying that this is the answer but um, to me if you have to soak a meat food in some kind of crazy digest made from um, half metabolised chicken feet and, and the vegan food you just put a little bit of brewer's yeast on and they like it, that does not say to me that cats prefer meat. Uh, another one is that uh, meat food is always healthier than vegan food. Uh, this one's really not true. Um, my favourite gross factoid is that um, in America, the FDA, the Federal Drug Association, did this big study where they analysed what was in dog food and cat food and they found the euthanizing solution that is used to put animals down in rescue centres. The animals in these rescue centres have been rendered into pet food. I mean, to me, that's, well, abhorrent anyway. It wouldn't happen in this country, I don't think. Uh, you would hope. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think it helps that um, fewer animals are euthanized in sanctuaries in this country. In America, it's pretty widespread. But don't, don't you think if, uh, the, there's not really a real difference between a queen cow and a dog into pet food? It's, it's a dead animal. Yeah, I agree with you on that point, but it's the fact that the there's euthanizing no solution was present. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. The waste is an important issue, but the fact that the, I think it's um, sodium pentabismol or something, it's what they use to euthanize your animal. That was actually present in the food. And it wasn't like one food. This was lots and lots of foods. Um, and to me, I mean, I agree with you that there is an ethical argument for rather than buying really high-end, ethical-ish meat foods, buying your stuff on the supermarket, which is rendered bits off the slaughterhouse floor, has an ethical argument to it. It's not one that I like, but this idea of rather than wasting animals or killing new animals, just put in what is left, because it might be adequate, is, is one ethical argument. Although it's a gross one. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another one is that dogs and cats are guaranteed to get their nutrition from meat. This isn't true. Um, at Ethical Pets we do sell meat food and we sell a vegan food and they are supplemented with exactly the same stuff because once you start chopping up your animal there is no guarantee that the taurine is still in it. Um, you know, a little bit of water here, a little bit of banging around there in the slaughterhouse and it's gone. You know, it's, it's, it's gone because it just washes away. Um, so again, if you buy a really cheap meat food from a supermarket it probably doesn't have any natural taurine in it anymore. You're probably feeding your cat artificial taurine in exactly the same way as the vegan food. Uh, this cats for all foods, I mean, they even admit to how much they supplement with taurine and stuff, particularly the cats, and the same with the, the dog trace elements that they need. Um, another interesting one, which I'm going to talk about next, is this idea that it's wrong to impose your views on an animal who has no choice. So, um, what is natural for companion animals? Um, I wonder if this is really a relevant question for domesticated animals. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about domestication. Um, it's quite important. Um, for starters, it's a very long process, not a single point. So dogs were domesticated a long time ago, quite fully, in a relatively short period of time, whereas cats have taken a long time uh, to be domesticated. Um, 
It means more than just tame. A domesticated animal may not be tame. For example, our cows and sheep may not be tame, but they are domesticated. Um, and domestication is a genetically embedded change. It's not just a behavioural thing. It's, it's something that is, is, is bred year after year into these animals. Um, and indeed, it probably starts with a genetic difference in the first place. Um, so some of these genetic differences include reproductive changes. If you look at your dogs being in season a couple of times a year, your hens laying eggs every day, that is the effect of domestication. Um, adaptations to a poorer diet is a big part of domestication. Um, metabolic dependency on humans for food. Uh, my favourite one is neoteny, which I can't pronounce, but that's basically, um, you know you have your tiger in a zoo or wherever, and when it's a baby, you can play with it like a, like a little rock line. Uh, and it's fun, and then when it gets older, it takes your arm off and kills you. Um, that is because it's not domesticated. So with your dog, they, they, they basically maintain some of their child features until adulthood, which is where we get floppy ears from, you know, cats pressing grapes, that's part of that. So some of the ones is a hereditary predisposition to trusting humans. This isn't like something we've taught them, like we do with the wild elephants. It's something that is genetically encoded into our animals. Um, and another one is the ability to breed for specific traits. So with dogs, we can pretty much, if we want to design a dog by breeding it with other dogs of certain traits, we can achieve that. I'm not saying we should, but we can. Um, and this is some of the evidence why cats were domesticated later, because we have less control over cats' um, biology. Um, and this is all from artificial selection, this is why this happens. So it's a bit like evolution, but it's controlled either consciously or unconsciously by humans. And this goes all the way back to Darwin, you know, he was, this is where his theories began with, with an understanding of pets and domestication. Um, so, um, to reiterate this difference, some wild animals, like elephants, can be tame, but this is behavioural, they are not domesticated, they are wild. Um, farm animals can be domesticated, but they may not be tame. Um, many domesticated animals, for example feral cats, become untamed. Um, over a few generations. However, they are still biologically domesticated and we can see this when either themselves or their first generation offspring become like house cats almost immediately because they have a genetic predisposition to like those. So, how did dogs get to this stage? Uh, well, dogs were wolves. Uh, this is one theory, by the way. Um, it's, I think it's a really great theory though. So, um, dogs were wolves and they came closer to humans naturally. Humans started staying in one place a little bit more to do some farming, and so the dogs moved, the wolves moved a little bit closer inwards, and they um, picked up the, the injured animals that had been, you know, injured in the hunt but not killed, etc. And you know, lots of nice uh, rats living around our newly installed brain stores, um, and then we stole their young and domesticated them. Um, so the reason why we understand this is because there's a genetic bottleneck. All dogs can be traced back to some common ancestors um, from some common places. Um, and there's some really extreme equivalents of this. It's really messed up. You know the golden hamsters you buy in shops? They all came from one pregnant mother with 15 <laughs> little hamsters inside her, uh, captured in the 1930s or something, like every single one of them. I mean, that is in breeding in like a mass scale. Uh, let me explain why they're not so bright. Um, like, mine puts its treat in like that and then tries to go in its house, and it's just not clever. Um, so these dogs have been domesticated for a very long time and they are really quite different to their wild ancestors. You know, you sit your little eagle thing next to your wolf thing and you can see they are not the same anymore. Cats are even more interesting because actually they domesticated themselves. There is no genetic bottleneck. This went on for a long, long time, a very, very long time, as in thousands of years. And the reason why there is no genetic bottleneck is because we had absolutely no use for them at all. They don't do anything. Um, we don't, for example, you know, we don't even, they didn't genetically have them, uh, sorry, historically have them as mouses because they don't really catch that many mice. We get ferrets or dogs to do this for us. Um, so basically they were tolerated or worshipped, depending on the area of the world. Um, and so full domestication of cats is actually quite recent, like maybe three, four, five hundred years rather than thousands. Um, and therefore, we have this inbreeding with wild cats, which is why cats are A, more similar to each other, and B, more similar to wild cats. Um, which is quite interesting because, um, obviously, they're closer to the wild animal, but then they chose to be here. Um, and one of the reasons why this started was, again, mice around the grain stores, maybe the odd food scrap, bits left over by dogs, you know. Um, and so, it's interesting, I mean, historically, we 
we haven't had that much of a great relationship with cats always. We've not always seen them as being useful at all. I mean, if you think about how they were treated in the plague in England, they were killed because they were deemed responsible. It's a bit like the badger thing, you know, completely stupid, but it happened. And apparently it ended up with um, the plague lasting for many, many years more because they killed all the cats and they couldn't kill the bats as much. Um, so, yeah, I think it's interesting that cats did basically choose to be here. There's a lot of evidence for that. Um, so, um, this thing about animals who have domesticated themselves or partially domesticated themselves through convenience or pleasure, I think is really important with vegan food. One question could be, uh, if cats naturally choose to eat what they enjoy and naturally choose to be near humans because it's easier, is it unnatural to give them vegan food as long as they like it? Um, I think that's a complicated question. Uh, I'll repeat it. Uh, so, if cats naturally choose to eat what they enjoy, and if they naturally choose to be near humans for convenience, is it unnatural to feed them vegan food as long as they like it? Um, so, even more provocatively, if the ancestors of our cats have repeatedly <coughs> chosen to live with humans despite a poorer diet, definitively poorer diet than they would have had in the wild, um, are we morally wrong for feeding them any given food um, as long as they don't suffer actively? I'm not sure. I mean, in reality, most people in this country feed their cat on complete rubbish. Junk from the supermarket made out of diseased, dead, dying bits of stuff on slaughterhouse floor. And it is seen as acceptable. Morally speaking, this idea of the perfect diet for your cat is new. My parents certainly didn't feel this way. They weren't cruel to their animal, but the cat got what it was given. Um, and there is something to be said for that. Um, perhaps not for the cat, but certainly for the wider community and for the wider world. The idea of killing an animal specifically to give to your cat when there are other animals and human animals. Don't forget, if we're going to call them non-human animals, that means humans are animals too and deserve the same respect. There are human animals starving through lack of food because we eat so much meat. My slide here is brief. Um, nutrients are necessary, pleasure is necessary, which includes palatability, love, entertainment, medical, there are lots of things that are necessary for a cat, but I'll focus on nutrients. Um, so nutritional requirements, what are they and where do they come from? Um, so the minimum levels for nutrition are suggested or set by a governing body. They are inspired by research from pet companies which is often closed, which I have a huge bug with. I think if you're going to research something scientifically, the public should be able to access that for free. Um, and I don't see why I should trust science that I can't see either. I like to read my papers. Um, also, universities have done stuff, old stuff from like the 60s. I mean, I don't know if any of you know much about animal research, but animal research in the 60s and 70s made today's stuff look humane. <coughs> I mean, one of the reasons why we know that Taurine is necessary for animals is because they took and killed some day old kittens, like unsuckled kittens. They never even had milk from their mother before they were killed. And that is the research which contributes to our nutritional requirements. Um, so it's not happy meeting, and it's not, you know, nutritional requirements aren't a good thing for vegans, ethically speaking. You know, in some ways we should ignore it all and refuse to partake in this. Um, thankfully, I think the situation has settled down now with animal testing in pet food, but uh, it used to be horrific. Um, so they are similar from country to country, but not at all the same. There is not one ideal nutritional setup for a cat. Some countries don't have any of these recommendations. The UK is under FEDIAF, FEDIAF, um, and the USA is under AFCO. Um, and these include proteins, minerals, vitamins, etc. But interestingly, in the entire recommendation, the word carnivore is not mentioned at all. Um, it's not considered to be relevant by our um, suggesting body. So I have a picture here of one of the charts and it basically says, you know, like protein this much per 100 grams, taurine this much per 100 grams, etc. And all of the vegan pet foods that we sell meet this criteria and I have seen proof of that. Um, so how do we know that a food is nutritious enough and meets those requirements? The first way is because it should be, based on the ingredients. We look at our ingredients, we figure out how much is in that, and we figure out how much should be in the pet food. However, the manufacturer might affect the levels as it does with meat food. So the next thing we can do is a lab analysis where we just, you know, power it all up, put it in the test tube, and bam. And that tells us um, what's in it. And that's the way that Bonebo do theirs. 
and Yara do theirs as well. Um, that's pretty common. Um, but what if they don't absorb those nutrients? What if they just poop them out? Um, so the next thing we can do is examine the poop and see what's left over. If we have 100 micrograms of taurine in our poop, we know that they haven't absorbed that taurine at all. Um, so the questions here are how far should we take this research? Should we, should we have animals in a lab like Mars do and they don't kill them anymore but they check to see what's in their poop? Uh, is that really a life for an animal to be kept in a, you know, box and fed and the poop taken away? I think it's awful. Um, so there is another way to do this. For example, um, the big animal experiment with the pedigree food that I told you about that told us about our dog food was um, was done in a an, in a pound for dogs who had been moved from country to country, and it's done in Australia where they have a lot of restrictions on animals moving from the country. Um, of course, whether or not it's right to, to do that to an animal is still the question, but at least you're not breeding animals specifically to test food, vegan food on. Um, and also, we need to consider the anecdotal evidence. I mean, for me, I have four cats and two dogs. They're all vegan and they're all fine. And in fact, one of them's healthier than she was when she had me. And for me, that's. I my mum always says the proof is in the pudding. Um, I think that's quite important too. Um, and so we need to consider how vegan food should be tested and how far we are willing to pursue the possibility of harm from these vegan foods or not pursue. Uh, I think we have it about right with a lab analysis, by the way, that's my personal opinion. Um, so now onto the part two in terms of science. Um, the big study with dogs was by Dr. Wendy Brown. Uh, she got a pack of racing huskies in um, in New Zealand, and um, half of them were fed a vegan diet, and half of them were fed meat diet. And you know, because they all do the same amount of work, so it's a really good way of testing. And they were all fine um, over the I think, nine week racing season plus six weeks of training beforehand. Um, but obviously, that's quite short term. But you know, these are these are huskies doing big races, they're, they're under a lot of stress, um, and they were all okay. So, obviously, we have to question these huskies racing is that ethical? I don't know. Um, would more studies like this be ethical uh, in medicine, where they have a placebo versus you know a medicine which they think works? The question is always: Is it ethical to give someone who's ill a placebo? Um, and obviously, as I said earlier, there's a lot of evidence of harm from meat foods, but no evidence of harm from veggie foods. Um, cats are more complex, as we know. Um, a couple of studies have shown that cats are fine within the bounds of the test taken. So basically, they've Got a lot of cats. One of these studies is by Nestle, one of them is by some independent people. I know Nestle. Nestle found that vegan cat food is healthy. Woohoo. Uh, it's crazy, isn't it? Um, nice of them to act on that knowledge. But um, they, yeah, basically they took some blood tests for this and that and the other and they tested them and they were all fine. And what's really interesting about this is these were both done in the USA where another study found that these two major brands of vegan cat food in the USA were missing quite a few things that should have been there because they hadn't had this lab analysis. Um, so this doesn't show that vegan foods are unhealthy, it just shows that um, lab analysis is important and that quality control is vital. Quality control was blamed for the absence of this, they put the ingredients in the wrong order. Um, however, the really important thing is it shows that even with cats, with all of their needs and all of their demands, um, there is a little bit of room for error. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't make an effort, but at least we know we don't have to panic. This is this slide about what happens if we fail. So failing to meet the nutritional requirements is not just an issue for vegan foods. Uh, animals adapt, domesticated animals have already adapted to a large degree. We should try very hard to give our pets the right nutrients. However, we shouldn't be frightened of failure. You know, we have seen evidence that animals with a substandard food are okay. Um, and remember that humans are animals too, and that there are many humans in the world whose nutrition is vastly worse than my cat and my dog, um, thanks to overconsumption of meat by the West. Um, and we need to weigh up the possibility of failure against the effects of not trying at all. So, vegan pet food is not perfect at the moment. Um, there is a lack of variety. We have basically two brands in this country which I consider to be safe and the correct standard. Um, that is not enough. If your cat is picky about the pellet size or the taste, you need to have more than two brands to choose from. That includes meat foods. Um, I mean, we have we have four cats, and we found uh, one of the vegan foods they're quite happy on. But when we were trying them on meat foods, you know, we had to try six or seven ones before we found one that suited them. 
Um, so we need urgently to have more brands, which is what I actually passed this round now. I have a petition um, for Yara to please make a vegan cat food, because they are considering. So anyone who wants to tell Yara, please make a vegan cat food, please do pass that around. Um, so another problem is lack of funding for research. We shouldn't have two or three studies to tell us that vegan cat food is safe. We should have many, many studies. Um, and we need some way to, food, uh, to fund this. And the best way to fund this is to buy the stuff because the more that gets sold, the more money they have for research. Um, quality control is a big problem, not so much here, but in the US it's, it's an issue um, to make sure that we have all those nutrients in. Um, a weird one is the lack of openness which exists. Um, one of the criticisms from the real expert in this, whose um, information is on the blog, but his website is something like um, veggiepets.info or something like that. Um, he says that you know after this American study which showed that the food was nutritionally deficient, one of the companies wouldn't even respond. Another issue which, which is my particular bugbear is a major lack of competition in the UK. We have some accidental monopolies in this country that if they were not in this little niche market of vegan pet food would not be legal. And I don't think that they're doing this on purpose to harm people, it's just that how many companies sell vegan pet food? Like three, four? Uh, and it, it needs to change. And also a lack of practical discussion. Um, I would urge all of you who have successfully got your cat onto vegan food to um, try and be open to people who are really struggling with this, either ideologically or practically, because um, it's, it's in the best uh, benefit of the animals in the end. If we can persuade people to feed their pet half and half, it's not perfect, but how many animals are saved through that? Lots and lots. And if we don't talk about it, we can't convince people of this. This slide is called The Bigger Picture. Um, basically, I've said that whatever your verdict, whether or not you succeed, in giving your cat or dog a vegan food, there will always be more ways to save animals. And I made a chart, um, I didn't finish it um, because I was ill, but basically I tried to list every single product that we sell and a few other um, theoretical products, for example, the worst case scenario meat food and the worst case scenario vegan food, and then divide it up into companion animal life, farm animal life, wild animal life, lab animal life, human animal life, long-term environmental considerations, for example global warming, which will also kill animals and is killing animals right now. I marked um, either black for not relevant, green for saves the animal, or red for actively harms the animal. And, you know, it's huge. I mean, if you buy a cat food that contains meat, an animal has died to go into that. However, if it's organic, therefore animals in the rainforest are not dying for that food. And, you know, this isn't like a willy-nilly kind of habitat destruction argument. They are, you know, there was a case recently where an orangutan was torched alive because they wanted it to move and it wouldn't move. You know, organic is not like a second-rate consideration for vegans. If you can buy organic, you are saving animals' lives by buying it. And, and that is important, especially with stuff like soya. Um, and then, you know, if we look at lab animals, you can buy a meat food that maybe killing animals in one place, but you are, if it's not tested, you are saving the life of another animal, or at least saving the suffering of another animal. And again, human animal life is important. By buying a veggie food, you're not just buying a food which saves the life and health of companion animals and farm animals, but you're buying one which stops the suffering of humans who work in slaughterhouses. They are usually immigrants, they are usually poor, ill-educated, and oppressed in a major way, which is not acceptable. And you know, I mean, the, the horrors, can you imagine that job, being forced to do that job every day, it messes with people, and there are studies which show that. Um, and it's the same with, I mean, almost any given pet product that you choose, there is a way to save an animal's life by making a better choice. And some really good ways, I've got a list here. Okay, so, um, if you have a pet who can't both eat vegan food or you're unsure, you can save animals by feeding that pet only vegan treats. There aren't many dogs who won't have vegan treats. I've never met one. There's always one that suits them. And that saves the life of animals. Um, you can save wild animals by feeding them organic. This may be little little creatures in this country, or it may be orangutans in, in the rainforest and things. Um, you can save lab animals by buying untested. You can save or help some human animals by using organic and fair trades. Fair trades is an issue I haven't mentioned. Um, you can safeguard human and non-human animal life by using eco and recycled products. 
you can put money into vegan pet food by voting with your pennies. So a good example of this is Yara. They make vegan food and meat food. And their second biggest seller is their vegan dog food, you know, by volume, because, not even because of vegetarianism, because of um, the allergies that many dogs have to meat. So if you buy from them, even if you're buying meat, that money goes into advertising actively vegan food to other people. And I think that's a start. Um, you can keep money out of unethical practices in the same way. For example, which company you buy from? Do you buy from a more ethical company who sells meat, or do you buy from Zoo Plus or Pets at Home, whose business practices and ethics are appalling? I mean, if you buy um, from Pets at Home, the money that you spend there is used to advertise IAMs, which is tested on animals. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's about more than just what you are buying, it's about where you're buying it from. And also, you can buy from a vegan-owned company, um, no matter what it is that you're buying, there's usually some vegan somewhere selling it. Uh, trying to find a midpoint. If you have a cat that, that doesn't want to eat vegan food, try and give it some vegan food. Try and at least make it to the products vegan-friendly. You know, just try and find a balance and strive as hard as you can uh, in at least the right direction, even if it's not perfect. Um, so, conclusion. I have left this slide blank um, because I don't... Um, I feed my cats on vegan food, I feed my dogs on vegan food, I think it's healthy, but I don't feel that there is enough evidence to conclude categorically anything other than the fact that we need to try harder and that there's a long way to go. Um, and I don't, I don't think that any scientist at the moment can tell you that vegan food is harmful, and I don't think that any can tell you that it's perfect, because they haven't done any research. Um, and it's lazy of scientists to sit there and tell you that it's wrong when they haven't tested it. In any other area of science, it would probably not be acceptable. Um, but it's just because it's such a small thing. There's so few of us. I mean, how many of us are in this room? There's so few people who are interested in this. I have got a link here, which I'll put online, to a really interesting looking article on um, the IAMS website entitled The Importance of Animal-Based Proteins in Dog Foods. Um, what I would really like is any interested parties to come on our blog and let's discuss how they've said and what they've said and why they've said it and if it's accurate and where the evidence is. Because maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but it would be really interesting to learn how to, to play with this. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Um, I know I've fitted a lot in and I've talked like, too fast, but thank you for listening. Did anyone like the samples I passed around? Mm. Yeah, they look they look like dog food, cat food, don't you?